All right, welcome back. It's been a while. Um, a lot of people have been asking for a new episode, and I've been planning this one for quite some time. I'm sorry I can't do more of these episodes. It's just making music and creating Minta Foundry packs is uh, my priority number one. And making podcasts is something that I want to do on the side. But I'm so glad that everybody enjoys these, and it seems that people are learning something, so that's, that's even better. Yeah, we're back. My name is Al Hogg, and this is Minta Foundry Breakdowns. Today's composition is going to be a bit different, but before I say anything about it, let's just listen first. Some of you might actually already heard this one. I created a video for it and it's on my Instagram account. The thing that's special about this composition is that first of all it's only three tracks. It's a piano track, a bass track and a drums track. The goal for it was to sound like a jazz trio or playing, right? And here's where the interesting thing comes in. The whole composition was recorded without a grid. There's no click track. It doesn't sync to a specific BPM, it's just one free composition. There's obviously a few challenges recording something without a click when you're alone, because you have to synchronize each new track to the previous tracks and there's no guide really, except for the music. The way I recorded it was, I started with the piano first. Um, I did a couple takes until I was convinced that the one that I had played was interesting for the other instruments to then come in and add stuff. So one of the challenges was for the bass to be in time with the piano. And the composition is not only off-grid or off-tempo, the tempo is something very flexible in this composition. So I'm slowing down, I'm, I'm going faster in certain parts. When I got to the drums, it was really hard for me to be in sync with the other two instruments. So what I did is I just looked at the computer to kind of see the transients and that made it a lot easier to hit in the right spots. One of the cool things about creating one of these Rubato compositions is that you get to play with time a lot more than you would usually, right? Obviously, a composition like this will not be drag and drop ready for a producer to just slap drums over it you kind of have to be creative in the slicing process. But you know, tons of hip hop tracks that we love, classics, sampled records that were not recorded to a click track. So, you know, why not be inspired by that? Before playing you the isolated tracks and, and really getting into details on the plugins used on the isolated tracks, I want to talk to you about the master chain. The Master Chain has three plugins on there. One is the Ampex ATR-102 Tape Emulation Plugin by UAD. One is the API 560 EQ. And then I have another uh, Q3 on there. I'm going to play you a section of the sample with no plugins on the master. And then I'm going to turn them on. So without... And now with... So 
obviously it's just louder that's one thing the mpex adds some nice tape distortion to it and i use the api 560 to boost the highs and make it more present in the end i have a pro q3 that kind of rolls off some of the higher frequencies because i just felt like it was too bright in the end but you know i use the api to boost highs and then the q3 to just roll them off there's also a UAD capital chamber as a reverb send, but we're gonna look at this later. So let's look at the piano. The piano was recorded with two dynamic mics, the EV635A in a XY placement, just above listening position, basically where I'm hearing the piano. This recording was made a couple months ago since I have changed my microphones on the piano to uh, a pair of AKG C414 microphones. I still like the dynamic sound and I'm thinking about bringing them back and just have them as an option for future projects. I'm not going to talk too much about the harmony and the theory behind the composition, but maybe check this out. The start and the end of the composition is the exact same intro slash outro but in the end I play it one whole step above. So here's the intro. And here we have the outro. let's look at the plugins on the piano first we have a pro q3 that just cuts out some of the frequencies that were annoying kind of cleaning up the sound then we have an api 560 to boost the highs the dynamic mics don't have a lot of higher frequencies so boosting with a vintage style eq usually helps get a clearer sound then we have the J37 tape emulation plugin that is used to uh, make the sound more vintage. And in the end, I have a Teletronics LA2A by UAD. The compressor doesn't do much. I wanted to keep the composition very dynamic, obviously, since I wanted to emulate a um, old jazz recording. All right, let's listen to the bass solo first. sounds kind of boring but that's basically what a bass line needs to sound like when you put it in solo on a double bass track i would always have a tuner plugin because the double bass doesn't have any frets so tuning is sometimes a bit off and then we have a teletronics la2a for compression let's hear the difference here's without the compression and here's with very slight difference um, i'm not sure it does a lot next up we have the drums this was recorded with one overhead mic which is a km 184 small condenser good for this style I, I feel like for jazz drums the overhead mics are probably the most important thing so um let's listen to the recording solo The role for a drum part in a composition like this is really to fill in the blanks using pickups, using ghost notes, kind of bring everything together. Listen to this section without the drums. And now with the drums. The 
goal was to follow the dynamics of the piano and the bass recording and bring everything together. On this track I used another API 560 to roll off the highs. The KM184 by Neumann has a lot of high frequency and is kind of harsh, so I used the vintage style EQ to roll those off. I also have a J37 tape emulation on there to make it sound even more vintage. Now there's one more part that I want to show you, which is actually not an instrument, but it's a reverb return. So instead of putting reverb on every track, I use sends on the piano and the drums to add a room reverb, in this case the capital chambers by UAD. The reverb track is slightly panned to the right. This technique was used in older jazz recordings to create some kind of stereo image in a setting where most instruments were just recorded with one mic. I'm gonna play you the reverb track solo. Hey, uh, this is Al. I'm currently editing this episode and listening back, I just noticed a huge mistake that I made in the sound design process. There's an error in how this reverb sounds. Uh, let me let me try to explain this. Uh, whenever I create a sample, I try to be as close to the original sound from the era that I'm trying to imitate. So if I'm trying to do a 60s, 70s soul record, I'm not going to use autotune, for example, because they didn't have autotune back then. So in this case, I'm trying to imitate a jazz record from the late 50s, and the reverb is supposed to be the reverb from the instrument in that room at the moment of the recording, right? So if we listen to the reverb track isolated, which in a real recording situation of a jazz trio we couldn't do because the reverb is kind of tied to the instrument recording. We shouldn't be able to hear the tape wobble on the piano track because the piano hasn't been recorded on tape at the moment that it hits the reverb. The reason why we can hear tape wobble in this case is not because of the ATR on the master, it's because I have a J37 plugin on the piano before we hit the reverb. So basically our chain is piano, tape wobble, and we send that sound into the reverb, and that kind of ruined it for me right there. Now it sounds more like everything was recorded to tape, and then they used a echo chamber to add the reverb to the recording which is fine, but it is not the thing that I was trying to imitate. Um, but no problem. Uh, I mean, I'll just try to do it better next time. Let's get back to the episode. So the composition took quite some time to uh, put together, but the recording in the end was done really fast. Now the question is, what happens from here, right? Do I send this out as a sample and write in the title no BPM? Do I chop it? Do I make it ready for someone? And the answer is um, yes, all, all of the above actually. Um, I've sent out samples without BPM and if people like the sample, they will figure it out. Yes, this is not drag and drop ready, but you can make a drag and drop ready version for them. So slice it yourself and give them the option of having um, a sample with a fixed BPM. And that's what I did. I sent it out as a whole composition. I sent it out as a flip version and I even made my own beat with it. So I want to play you the beat I made with this sample. Here we go. Thank you. 
For the first time in this series, I want to try something and make the stems to this project available to purchase. If you're interested in learning more, listening to the dry and wet versions, there's going to be alternate piano takes in there. If you have Ableton, you can open the project, look at all the plugins and everything. So if you're interested in that, you can find the link in the show notes. Thanks for listening. Remember, be creative with this sample making thing. It's music. We're supposed to push the boundaries, try new stuff, make mistakes, fail, learn. It's all part of the journey. Go crazy. If you want, you can subscribe to the podcast, follow me on Instagram, follow Minta Foundry on Instagram, go to our store, check out all the packs if you're interested in buying sounds, one shots, Mellotron expansion packs, percussion breaks, presets for RC20, there's tons of packs on our store. Um, Thanks for listening, it's been a pleasure, Um, talk to you soon.